Thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to invite our other speakers to come and uh, sit at the front. So, Alan, don't try and creep off nice and quietly. Um, Anthony, if you could join us, and Maria, I think you need to be wired up. Um, we do have uh, some time for questions, and I think we've covered such a range this afternoon. Um, we have an enormous range of knowledge and experience actually here. It's a wonderful opportunity to ask questions. Um, I'm looking around for, ah, there's the important thing. Richard has the microphone. Um, oddly enough, these discussions don't just stay inside Barnard's Inn Hall. Um, we do have about 20,000 people attending our lectures each year. Uh, we also have an online community of approximately 2 million. So please catch my eye and get the microphone or your question won't get anywhere. So I think your hand went up first. No questions? Ah, so over here. Is that on? No. Oh, <laughs> I, uh, Alice has got to switch you on. We'll be there in a moment. My name is Paul Hudson. I don't have any affiliation anymore. I'm retired. Um, I'm glad I wasn't aware of Jim um, Tobin. Tobin's uh, quotation, Brazil is not for beginners. If I had known, I wouldn't have come. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm very, pleased that, I'm very pleased that I have come because we've had excellent speakers covering an awful lot of ground in a space of about 45 minutes each, and they've done it with tremendous uh, coherence and clarity, and I'm very grateful to you all. Um, there are a couple of questions that did concern me. This is not a criticism of you. You can't, you can't cover everything in just the 45 minutes each. Um, I think it was Professor Pera mentioned, in fact, that the, um, the stance of Brazilian governments, um, at least in recent years, was to open up the economy. And yet, as I understand it, the foundation of the BRICS Development Bank is a response, in fact, to the kind of Washington consensus free trade that uh, has dominated the IMF thinking for the last three or four decades. So I was trying to uh, reconcile that. And the other question, and I don't know whether it's connected with it or not, it may be independent. Um, Professor Connell mentioned, in fact, the uh, railway that was being um, built, in fact, by the Chinese. Now, from what I have read by Fred Pierce in The New Scientist, for example, he writes a lot on the environment and the director of War on Want. Um, he's written a book that um, I think he's called it Problems Within Capitalism. I can't remember the exact society. But it does seem, I don't want to sound xenophobic here, but whether the Chinese have been heavily involved in uh, developing countries, the project goes so far and then they want more. And I wonder to what extent you would, that you, the members of the panel, would regard this as a uh, project that might actually run into big problems maybe in 10, 15 uh, years. I don't know how long it is they're going to take to have to build the railway. Yes, Adam, would you like to lead on that one? Railways in China? I, I'd quite like to just comment on the second one. Do you want mm. to talk about the opening up of the economy? But y yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just got, while well, the second one's hot, because I, I thought about saying something about in mind, because obviously the relationship between Brazil and China is really key for Brazil and very interesting. So I think one thing you can be sure of, the Brazilians see China both as an opportunity and a threat. Um, there is no way they're going to allow the Chinese to buy up um, great swathes of their agricultural land or in any way getting, getting, a, getting a charge of the economy. They're very focused on that. It, it's not because it's China. They wouldn't let anyone do it, and they're certainly not going to let the Chinese do it. Uh, but at the same time, they want investment. Um, the needs that Brazil has for infrastructure are enormous. It has a lot of its own resources through its own development bank, but it badly needs foreign investment. It tries to raise money in London here, and it has a little bit of success, but people are... You know, hesitant about whether they're going to get, get a decent return and what the legal certainties are, whereas China is going there seemingly with an open checkbook. Um, I think we should uh, hold our breath over this railway. Railway projects in Brazil don't have a great track record of getting done anytime <laughs> soon. Uh, that's why the Chinese are involved in this, because the Brazilians have kind of lost the plot on railways, sadly, um, through not doing anything for 50, 60 years. 
uh, and there will be all sorts of objections about the route. But um, you know, there's no doubt that Brazil does need some outlet into the Pacific. And this port of Assu, where it's going from, is in deep trouble. Uh, this, this was a port built by, the name won't mean anything to you, a gentleman called Ike Batista, who, was, who, was, who famously uh, got very angry with Forbes when they described him as the eighth richest person in the world. He said, I'm the fourth richest person in the world. <laughs> he has since hit the buffers. Uh, the port has not developed as expected, but mm. is there and, uh, and needs to be developed further because Brazil is very short of port facilities. It's also very important for the UK because Anglo-American, one of our uh, FTSE 15 countries, has a huge project which brings iron ore to Asu and wants to get it over to China in, in, in other ways. So it will be a very interesting project. I suspect it will take a long time uh, to, get, uh, to get decided if it ever happens. Um, they do need Chinese money, they do need Chinese expertise, but they'll be very cautious about giving them any kind of grip over the economy. And of course, it's also interesting because the railway obviously would go in both directions and it would give uh, Peru, Bolivia, possibly Chile access to the Atlantic. And that yeah. therefore sure. might mean that there's more support in the hemisphere than might otherwise be the case. Um, the other interesting thing, I think, from the point of view of China is that its resources really aren't infinite. They're also talking about building another canal through Nicaragua. Now, everyone back to Lord Nelson has failed to do this. Um, whether they succeed or not is another matter, but these are massive engineering projects, and I don't think we can look at a less than a 10 to 15-year time scale, even if everything goes well. And the thing years? about the modern world is that it's all moving so fast... It takes Whether that long to build a road in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, for heaven's sake, don't get and cost in, and in this country. <laughs> <laughs> you could get Virgin to run the railway, I suppose. That would be an interesting thought, wouldn't it? Um, yes, but I mean, this is one of the things that you are talking about. Yeah. Enormous civil engineering projects. The political idea, factors too. are there. The economic ones, the ecology is an interesting element as well. I can see lots and lots of opposition. Very brave thought, in a way. I mean, it's typical of Chinese thinking. Um, it reminds me rather of Groucho Marx, you know, we'll search the house next door. There isn't a house next door. OK, we'll build a house next door. <laughs> this is the way the Chinese seem to think, which is really very impressive. Time for another question. Well, uh, can I just, uh, yes, just, I beg just a quick response, response on, the, yes. on the BRICS Development Bank? Because I think you're right. It is partly an alternative to IMF World Bank. I mean, there, there has been an attempt to reform the IMF World Bank, the voting shares in those institutions. And, and there have been minor reforms, but I think they still very much reflect the post-World War II balance of power. They haven't been adapted to recognize the strength of countries like China. Uh, and so it is an alternative. And I, I'd say Brazil, uh, so Brazil is part of that project, and I think it likes that idea. But its own <coughs> development bank, the Benedes, also has more money than the World Bank in terms of loans. And it's, I would say it's not as statist a country as China. Uh, but it's, it's not also, it's not as laissez-faire as, say, the Anglo-American, as a sort of UK the state. So half of the credit from Brazil, in the Brazilian economy, for example, comes from state banks. I mean, that's, a, that's an example of the, f the relatively large role of the state. And I think there is a consensus about that. So when I, when I said that the go current government is tasked with um, sort of addressing the economic issues, I think the, the main issue is getting the government finances, uh, getting them back into surplus to a primary surplus. But there is this need for foreign capital as well. If you look at Brazilian savings rate, it's under 20%. China's is about 40. So they need to make up that gap in savings by attracting foreign investors to invest in infrastructure. And that's another goal of the government. But mm. yeah. thanks. Yes. Um, another question, Madame, down the front here, Richard. Um, during the protests, there was a banner that was um, being sort of waved about that said, we are not Venezuela. And I wondered what, what that kind of view was, really was about. I was wondering, sort of, what was the view of Venezuela when they're saying, we're not Venezuela? Well, what I, do I, they I mean by that? Was, oh, no, was, you, you might have a view on this, Maria, but um, uh, while, while, I, while I was in Brazil, I was, I was always very interested that... Um, um, I say the Brazilians on the whole didn't take much interest in, in, in what was happening in foreign affairs. Um, if, if, you, if you stop someone in, in, in Rio or, or whatever, a young person, they would know who the first six teams were in the Premier League in Britain, but probably not who the Prime Minister was, you know, it was, it was that, that sort of thing. Um, but, um, but actually, they, 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 they knew the countries where they thought things were a bit odd. And so, for example, I remember my gardener coming up to me during the... Um, 
the Rio Plus 20, uh, just before the Rio Plus 20 summit, and saying to me, they've invited that Iranian chap, you know, many, whatever his name is, you know, can't, can't take him, you know. So, so Brazilians do have, and, and it was a bit similar with Hugo Chavez. I mean, the most big, the average Brazilian thought that they saw him on TV in his six hour broadcasts in Venezuela, and they thought, well, oh, don't think much of him. And, 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 and yet the government had a policy of being, and I didn't go into this, a policy of uh, embracing Venezuela, doing joint projects with Venezuela, because the government strategically believed it was important mm. to be well positioned in Venezuela as it goes through some kind of transition. Same in Cuba, I would say. Mm. So there was a bit, of a, dis a bit of a difference between government policy and the, and the chap on the street, what they thought about Venezuela. But that's a very typical gut reaction, I think, from people uh, towards Venezuela mm. in Brazil. This <coughs> would, um, Thinking about this, uh, uh, we are not Venezuelans. Mm. I, uh, since the beginning of the 20th century, one, th one idea that appears every now and then is that one of the intellectual, many intellectual atrocities committed against uh, this part of the Americas is to consider them all the same. And Brazilians were very keen in, 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 a, in showing their individuality. They have. They are not Venezuela, they are not Colombia, they are not Uruguay. So they, they have a different history, a different uh, origin, um, maybe different aims. And uh, I think uh, as the time passed, I think it's true that when I was a student at the University of Sao Paulo, I mean, it's Latin America, South America, except Brazil, didn't really exist. I mean, we had um, historically our our I, views, I mean, our eyes turn to Europe or the United States, but not so much to Latin America. I think it's changing now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, yeah. it could be a reference to, it's a bit of an ambiguous statement, but it could be a reference to this fear of some people who are critical of the PT government, mm. that the yeah. PT government has Chavista intentions. I mean, this is a mm. criticism of this, ever since Lula came in in 2003, there's this fear of Venezuelization of, of Brazil. So um, I think it's a inaccurate, to, you know, the PT isn't a Chavista party, it's quite a pro-business party. Um, but there's this, yeah, there's this fear that it'll, it'll cause, a, you know, business to migrate, capital flight, uh, polarize the country. And so this has been a sort of refrain. I think Fernando Enrique used a similar term, he referred to Peronism, he said Lula is a sub peronist this is a sub peronist government. In other words, Populism of the left, mm -hmm. without a very high de high degree of sophistication, mm -hmm. that's going to set set the poor against the middle mm -hmm. class and the rich, and I, and I think there's a lot of fear of this in Brazil. Even though the comparison between Chavez and PT to me is is quite a, a stretch. No, yeah, it, of course, it, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, but it, it, this also says something about Brazilian foreign policy because uh, Brazilian president. Uh, whether it's Lula, even Fernando Henrique, they will embrace someone like literally embrace. Well. Lula was very good at embracing people, as you remember. <laughs> they would embrace someone like Chavez, and he famously always did. You always saw these pictures of Lula with his arms around, around Chavez, but literally that's what they were doing. Mm. You know, they, and, and they would never, 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 never publicly criticise what was happening in Venezuela, even if there was some really awful occurrence. Uh, and actually, true, mostly in other countries, they would never criticise because mm. um, their idea was, was, was embracing. So, the, the, so the, the, the person on the street who takes a dislike to you know, the chap who's running Iran or the chap who's running Venezuela or some other country, they will perhaps think wrongly that this means that the government approves of what they're doing. It doesn't. Mm. It's, it's all about politics uh, and, and diplomacy. Well, of course, there's also, I suppose, the fact you have got fairly strong left-wing governments in places like Ecuador and Bolivia, which might encourage left-wing elements in Brazil to think that they could follow this broad trend towards the left, anti-American, anti-business sort of stance. Um, I suppose the other two things are, of course, Venezuela is one of the many neighbouring states. Very much so. Um, and it is a, a, an oil power. Mm. And um, if the um, oil reserves in Brazil are not as high as people hope, then, of course, Venezuela would be... In prime position to be able to, uh, to supply. Um, the other thing which crosses my mind is that Caracas actually is the murder capital of the world. And my apologies for misquoting um, UNESCO earlier on. The figure of 42,000 dead was given for one year for 2012, but the same report did say that the number of gun deaths 
um, in Rio and Sao Paulo between 2002 and 2012 fell by more than 50%. So we mustn't be too alarmist about the headline, which I'm afraid I... I, I did put the correct details in my footnotes, but I'm afraid I went straight in at the top without... Uh, no, 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 they're in writing, fortunately, which is where I try to put them just in case I get it wrong. Uh, we have a question. The lady here, then the gentleman behind. Uh, hello. Um, it's really nice to be here and hear positive things about Brazil. And um, because I'm really concerned about the news that I hear from Brazil, because I follow the news there, and I wish the people in Brazil could hear what you're saying here, because the anti... Lula feeling, anti-pity feeling, it's dominating Brazil and people, especially the young people, they don't want to know about these numbers. They don't want to know how Brazil had improved in the last 20 years, for example. They just forgot the history, it's gone. And, um, and even historians, I, I was listening to uh, the TV culture, culture, culture news the other day, Marco Antonio Villa, I don't know if you know him. He, he hates Lula so much that it's painful to watch his criticism. And uh, he slices the information and then he gets quotes of something that allows him to criticize. And unfortunately for me, that's all the Brazilian people are here in Brazil. And, uh, and it's no surprise for me that how the Dilma popularity is decreasing. So how you... You know, how do you see the, the, the progress of Brazil continue, you know, either with PT or Dilma uh, or Lula, if he has any chance to be re-elected with the global poisoning the people, the Veja magazine poisoning, because people in Brazil, they don't hear things like that, they, like uh, the wonderful presentation and the numbers and the information that you put here today. So with, what chance do they have? Thank you. Um, I read recently uh, a very good and moving article by a journalist, 83 years old. I, f I forgot his first name. I think Santayana is the surname. And what he's, he was saying, uh, it's a very good and balanced article. So I'm not sure if I can reproduce the balance. But, um, he was saying, first, uh, the media doesn't inform, doesn't give information about the achievements of Brazil. It, it's uh, the, the big media, the national media, the, you know, the, the big media. Uh, not Carta Capital, but the big media doesn't. Um, it doesn't inform the, the readership about historical facts. People forget. They, they, I think they even forget that Fernando Henrique was part of the, uh, was against the dictatorship and that he, he was, he didn't, he was not a terrorist like Dilma, uh, as people uh, accuse her, but um, they were on the same side. So people forget, people forget or they never knew, or the young people don't know history, etc. But uh, um, what I thought was interesting about this article is that he said, uh, the PT in general is doing some disservice, misservice, I mean, it's not disservice. disservice to the country, not going to the media and to manage it somehow, if the media doesn't do it, manage somehow to inform about the achievements, the achievements that were mentioned here. The achievements in education, the achievements in uh, in industry, in, in so many in so many different uh, aspects. So they don't respond. So they, uh, he was saying about this is something that is extremely bad, not only for their, their own country, uh, for their own uh, government, but for the for the republic in general. So that's yeah, what I just a comment because I think if you take a publication like Veja, which is the biggest oh. national news magazine, you know, it's had an anti-PT agenda for years. So uh, if you go back to the Men's Salon, there was a famous cover of Veja with the broken red star saying, you know, this means that the party is finished. 
And I just went back to Brazil a few weeks ago, and I saw a, a, a cover of Veja that was almost exactly the same. It said, Partido en Extinção, PT, you know, it's, it's over. So they've been be beating this drum for a long time. Um, what's odd, I think, in Brazil is that most of the mainstream press, so if you take Veja, Folha, Estado, they're very much against the government that's been in power since 2003. Television, I think, is a bit more ambiguous, mm -hmm. but global, kind of wavers, but it's not as clearly anti-BT as the press. But they haven't really succeeded in convincing the majority of the electorate to vote against the BT, and neither in 2006, yeah. not in 2010, and not in 2014. So it is, it is one where the, the, the establishment media is against the government, but the government seems to be, in the last few elections, convincing people. Now I think it's a different situation, because now the anti-BT feeling has gone quite far down on the social scale. And you, you could get Lula running. I think the PT probably thinks at this point the only way that they would hold on to power at the federal level is somehow Lula is able to overcome these, these criticisms and run. But, but that also, ref I think, doesn't reflect that well on the party because they would be relying on, a, on an individual and relying on a sort of personalism yeah. that they historically were against. They were, they were, so, you know, they, they were formed to be a more programmatic party, a more ideological, programmatic, institutionalized party than the kind of personalism that you get in a lot of other parties. So I think it's a dilemma. I think it's a dilemma for the party, and um, it might be healthy for democracy for them to get out of power and think about what they, you know, what, they've, what they achieved in power and what they would want to do if they ever got back in again. Well, I agree with that. Just, just quickly three things. First of all, um, you know, Brazilians don't read a great deal on the whole. So I don't think the influence of Veja and Estado is, is, is that strong. The TV is much more important, you know, so global, uh, and they're more nuanced, as you say. But actually, one thing we heard about now, much more important than any of these, is the social media, which is much more varied. And, and there, I think, which is where the PT ought to be yeah. probably making a bit more of an effort. First of all, second point, I, I, rather, I rather agree with what, what you say, uh, that uh, I personally think it will be good for Brazil and for the PT to actually lose the next election. I and mean, they've been in power for a very long time now, and it will be good to regenerate a bit in opposition. Thirdly, Lula standing, uh, I mean, personally, I wonder if it would be a great idea. He did, he did and, and this was recognised by the opposition, Brazil a great service in not changing the constitution so that he could stand for a third mm. time. He could have done that, and he would have got it, and he would have won, mm. because he believed it would be good for Brazil uh, not to go in that direction and keep changing the constitution when it served the sitting president. Mm. So for him to come back now, I don't think that would be great. Uh, and I, I'm not even sure he would win. There's no doubt there's, that he'd have much better chance than anyone else from the PT. So, um, we'll, we'll, so we'll see. But, um, but going to your, your key point, you know, I, I say this personally. I, I do wish there was some way of, in, of uh, improving uh, basic education in Brazil. I think this is the key issue in Brazil, and none of the politicians focus on it enough. And it should include some understanding of where Brazil's come from in the last uh, 50 years. So that's really, really important. Uh, uh, and I, I think no better service could be done. So much has been good about Brazil, the university education, science, but the basic education has actually gone backwards in recent years. Yeah. It's free. It's free, but uh, if you think about it, uh, Brazil was one of the last countries to abolish slavery, and they were one of the last countries to get uh, middle incomes, to get everybody in schools. Only in the last generation that's happened. Uh, and, of course, they had a, a population increase, a lot of young people. That's now changed. Their birth rate's lower than ours in the UK. So that will change over the next generation. So the effort was to get everybody in school. Sometimes three shifts still exists. If you're, if you're a teenager, you probably don't go to school till five in the evening now. Uh, but there is a feeling that compared to the generation before, what comes out of basic education, the teachers are, not, are, are badly treated, not trained properly, not motivated. Um, the schools are often in dangerous areas. There are all sorts of things wrong. It's not just a matter of money either. Brazil has money. It's a matter of prioritisation, I think. And having done so well uh, with, in, 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 in higher education, the basic education does really need attention. Uh, about education, <coughs> I think this is the biggest challenge. Because if you look at the history, in the 30s, even in the 20s, 20s and 30s, there were a group of very, very determined people, very good people, who did a lot in different states. Mm. I did a work on Anizio Teixeira. He mm. was an amazing man. Mm. But, and he, he had this 
idea of opening schools for children uh, in the 30s uh, to stay the whole day. And what was his fate? He was considered communist and he lost power. I mean, he was arrested and then he, he changed his life. When the, um, after the dictatorship, after the end of the Second World War, he was called and he was working he was making money somewhere else. He was making, he had completely changed his life. He left everything and went back to the government. And then he started again with his campaign. Very determined, brilliant man with lots of good people around him. Later on, Darcy Hibir was one of them. And uh, dictatorship came again, he was out. And he died in suspicious circumstance in 1970. So there, is a, there was a lot, there has been a lot, a lot of interest, a lot of uh, uh, determination, but doesn't go ahead. I don't know. Mm. I don't know we, what's wrong. We only have time now for one more question, so I'll call to you if we could take it, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I've been to Brazil several times, and I, I've noticed um, how huge it is. Uh, the, the road infrastructure is, is really just along the Atlantic coast. Uh, places like Manaus, uh, I don't think, are linked uh, very well with roads at all. Uh, you have to use the aeroplane to um, uh, get around the country, and, or, or the river the Amazon River. Uh, so, uh, I, and uh, the roads are quite a very poor quality and, and dangerous. You can also be attacked on the roads at night uh, because of the uh, poor security. Um, so I, I was wondering uh, exactly what, um, uh, 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 what the country is gonna do to improve its roads. Uh, the, 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 the actual, um, uh, where it's viable, uh, obviously the Amazonia is, is not really practical to have roads probably, but uh, the, the East Coast, I went up to Recife and... Uh, Can we have the question please? Uh, so I, 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 I particularly wanted to know if, if the, um, the, the Chinese were going to invest in, in the road structure. Mm. Uh, well, yes. Um, we've heard that figure of 42,000 people who had violent deaths in 2012. It's about the same number of people died on the roads. So that's 80-odd thousand people dying violently in Brazil every year, half of them through road accidents. I was involved in a project which Dilma, the, the president, uh, started up to try and halve that number by 2020, together with um, um, uh, one or two famous racing drivers and other celebrities. Um, because it is a real problem. There are lots of issues around this. It's about drink driving, which is being cracked down on in some areas, particularly Rio, being very successful, but needs and stuff on needs to be done more widely. The state of the roads, the way people drive, uh, you know, pedestrianisation and so on. Um, so there are lots of issues. But, um, but fundamentally, uh, it was fascinating. In my time in Brazil between 2008 and 13, you saw a complete change of culture. Traditionally, and there are lots of novels written about this, uh, people who've gone to work in Sao Paulo would often go on holiday back to their folks 1,500 miles away, travel two, three days by bus and come back. That died in those five years. Everyone goes on the plane now. The central bus station in Sao Paulo doesn't have any long-distance buses hardly anymore. <laughs> so everyone, everyone flies. So in a way, the issue has been solved by everybody uh, using the plane as their bus. Uh, and, uh, and actually... Uh, that's a good thing in one respect because we don't want any roads in the Amazon. What roads bring is development, logging and so on. And so actually, you, you know, to build a six-lane highway to Manaus would not be great for the environment and, uh, and I don't think any of us should support it. <laughs> right, um, I'm afraid time is getting on and Gresham College tradition is that we start and end probably. One thing I would like to do, given the intellectual firepower and expertise of our speakers, one point to take away about Brazil for expert and aficionado alike. Anthony, what would you say the thing for us to look out for in the next couple of years with Brazil? Uh, I think the crisis is somewhat overstated and I would look for uh, some sort of resolution of, this, of these political conflicts and, and you know, setting the stage for the, for the next election in 2000, I mean the next presidential election. Yeah. Yeah. Maria? Ah, more optimism <laughs> and more and, uh, 
really uh, an effort to change the education, the basic education mm. in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I say two things. One, support Anthony that um, although things are, uh, is a very bad mood at the moment because of the economy and corruption, the, the, the fundamentals of Brazil have not changed. Brazil will be in 20 years' time uh, one of the top economies of the world, uh, which the UK and France may not be. So, you know, mm. basically Brazil... Uh, has a lot of problems, but it has so much going for it, it will go there. The second thing I would say is, I think, and Dilma actually, give her credit, did try a bit on this, but failed. What's really important in Brazil uh, to gain, to get rid of this terrible cynicism among young people about government is to do something about corruption. And that means having transparency in everything. Dilma actually joined a crusade on, on transparency, but unfortunately, you know, this sounds odd for the president of Brazil, she has no power. She, you heard, I mean, she was a backroom person, promoted to the job, but she doesn't really have the power to change things, and Brazil does need to do something on this thing about corruption and transparency. Otherwise, it will, it will alienate its young people for a generation. Well, needless to say, I've enjoyed myself enormously this afternoon. Um, interesting enough, I started off by saying that Brazil lent itself to stereotype and generalisation and broad sort of overviews, and I think in the course of the afternoon you can take away an awful amount of very, very useful information. One oddity which I would remark on, and that is that, the, that India hasn't been mentioned. And curiously enough, in King's College Library, which I'm also about to give a plug for, um, one of the books I got out about Brazil was published in India. And there's a whole chapter on comparisons, similarities, and reasons why Brazil and India should be much closer together. So that might be something to uh, reflect upon. Anthony very kindly brought some leaflets about King's, and they ran out. Could you please give us the, um, the web address, at least so people can follow up on the work being done by the um, Centre for Brazilian Studies I'll at put, I'll put a few more over oh, here. Oh, he's got yeah. a few more, yeah. so if you want to have a scrum. Um, but Anthony, what is, your, what is your URL for the Brazilian um, If you just go to www.kcl.ac.uk and look for the Brazil Institute, mm -hmm. put, put Brazil Institute into the search, you'll, you'll find us. Splendid. And of course the other thing is that um, King's College very kindly took over the Canning House Library when that was unfortunately closed a couple of years ago. And you may not be aware, but in fact non-members of King's do have access to the Canning House collection as part of the condition of their very kindly taking 50,000 volumes, which makes King's one of the strongest Hispanic libraries in the country. So I think that's well worth m mentioning. I would, however, like to express my thanks as well to both of our speakers. We've had some very interesting perspectives in the course of today, some very interesting observations in uh, response to our questions. I'm afraid we ran out rather on time. Our thanks, as always, to Valerie and the Gresham team for running the symposium, to our sponsors, the Mercer's Company and the um, Corporation of the City of London, and of course, thanks to yourselves, because without an audience, we'd only be talking to each other. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.